so I just admitted a few more people. Um, so, I, but I think it is six, it's a little after 6.30, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. And if anyone joins us, they can uh, join us in progress. So uh, before we get into things, my name is Matt Johnson, uh, and I am a project manager with the Montgomery County Department of Transportation. And I do wanna start off by thanking all of you for taking the time this evening to join us. Um, I think this is going to be a good conversation and we're really looking forward to the feedback that you can, uh, will give us tonight. Um, this project is about uh, finding ways that Montgomery County can improve both wayfinding and safety for people who have a vision disability. And this is a project that's been funded um, through a uh, grant from the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. And we also have joining us uh, this evening, Tool Design. There are there uh, the consultants on the project who are helping us with the uh, constructing the toolkit and uh, the initial design work for our uh, pilot location. Um, so, uh, Jim, do you mind advancing the slide? Um, and I do want to point out that we do have uh, closed captioning available. So, if um, if you would like to see the closed captions, you can. Uh, click the closed caption button on the bottom of your screen. It may be in the more menu if it does not appear directly there. And we also have American Sign Language Interpretation, which you should be able to see um, on your screen. Um, so um, with that, I'm going to go over some goals for the meeting and then we're gonna introduce the people who are here to, uh, to help us out tonight. Um, what we wanna do um, first off is inform you about the project and talk about some future opportunities for public engagement for you to give us input on the project. Um, we would like to talk about how we've developed an understanding of uh, people who have visual impairments and how they navigate in the world. Um, and, and we wanna hear that from you. Um, we also wanna get feedback from you um, about uh, the challenges that you face and then Finally, we're going to introduce and get some feedback on the design principles that are uh, leading um, our, our efforts to um, create the toolkit to address the navigation challenges and the safety challenges that, that you face when you're uh, navigating in the world. Jim, next slide, please. Um, so the agenda tonight, we're going to start off with some housekeeping. Uh, we'll do introductions and then we'll introduce the project. Uh, we'll talk about um, our understanding of people who have uh, vision disabilities uh, and understanding those challenges that you face. Um, we're gonna talk about the principles and tools for designing for people with vision disabilities. Um, we'll take some questions and comments and then we'll go over next steps. Next slide, Jim. Um, so in terms of housekeeping, I think, do we have another slide after this, Jim? With the, yeah, so this, this call, the, the Zoom is being recorded. So please be aware that anything you say or put in the chat window is being recorded. Uh, we will post the recording of this meeting to our website uh, in a few days, once we've had a chance to make sure it's, uh, it's cut and um, captioned uh, properly. Um, so if you, if you uh, were not able to, you're all at the meeting, but if you have any friends who are not able to attend the meeting, um, or if you would like to review this meeting recording later, you will be able to access them on our website. Um, next slide, Jim. Um, just some ground rules for the meeting. Um, please try and speak slowly and clearly. And I know I'm guilty of accelerating, so I'm, I'm gonna try and keep myself in check and not go too fast. Um, we'd like you to try and keep any remarks to 30 seconds or less um, so that other people have a chance to speak. We can always come back to you if you have a lot to say. And I, I know that there, you probably all have a lot that you wanna give us uh, information wise. So we would love to hear that, but let's try and make sure that we give everyone a chance to speak. Um, as a general rule, please identify yourself before you uh, give your comments. Um, and if you are referencing a slide or anything that's been said previously, please make sure you are clear about what you're referencing so that we're all on the same page. Uh, Jim? Well, can I say something real quickly, please? Uh, I am blind. Um, and if you can add to the general rule that the presenters describe the slides that they're presenting because they I am blind and I'm sure there are other blind people in the audience. Thanks. Uh, yes, we absolutely will describe the slides. Um, there are no graphics on the slides that you have that have been up so far. So um, all, all that's on the slides are the text that I've been saying. Uh, but we will we will describe any pictures or graphics that are on the slides. That's a very good point. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, just, I, I mentioned this at the beginning, but in case anyone joined um, since then, you are all muted when you um, 
when you joined, but you do have the ability to unmute yourself. Uh, we would like you to try and use the raise hand feature um, if you would like to speak, but, but don't do that quite yet because um, we're going to take a poll in just a minute. Um, in order to speak, you will need to unmute yourself. Um, and um, if you'd like to use the chat feature, you can um, communicate with it via the chat feature. Um, go ahead, Jenna. And Katie, is there anything else you wanted to add to that, Katie? Um, hi, everyone. This is Katie Hoiser from Tool Design. Um, and I just wanted to note that the chat feature we only have enabled so you can talk with the meeting host. Um, just for ease of all those using screen readers. Um, for those of you, you using computers, um, if you're having trouble reading text on Zoom, it may be something on your um, operating page. Um, if you're using Windows, you can open settings, um, click on ease of access menu. In this window, you can make the text bigger or make the icons bigger. Um, we have a screenshot of how to do so. If you're using a Mac computer, you can open system preferences, um, click on the display menu option. On that tab, you can select scaled and um, depending, on the type of computer, depending on the type of computer that you have, um, you can select larger text or choose a resolution that is best for you. Next slide. Um, if some of you are listening via your phone and you have your computer open as well, um, we would appreciate if you please link your audio. Um, you can find your participant ID on your screen as shown in that screenshot. Um, and you can access your audio settings by clicking on the arrow next to join audio on the bottom left hand of your computer. Um, once you give that number, you can type in on your telephone, pound the uh, participant ID and then pound again. Um, this is just helpful so that we know um, who you are, and it links your audio to your video. And the the participant ID number is three seven five three zero zero. No, no, that, that's not. That's just the one that's in the example. You you would have your own unique an <laughs> ID. Everyone, My apologies. Everyone has, everyone My has apologies. Their... Don't worry. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah. So the participant ID is um, specific to. Uh, next slide. Um, if you're new to Zoom, you'll notice that there is a toolbar on the bottom of your screen um, with a couple of options. This includes mute, um, start video, the participants window, and the chat box. Um, if you don't see this toolbox, you may need to maximize your window by clicking on the outline square in the upper right hand corner. Um, and we have a screenshot of how to do that on our slide. If you click on the chat icon, the chat window pops up in a small area where you can ask um, questions or ask comments um, to the host. Um, and please know just that you cannot communicate with others during this meeting, just the meeting host. Uh, next slide. Raising your hand is going to be very important during this meeting. Um, if you'd like to speak, we would encourage you to raise your hand in Zoom. And there are multiple ways to do this. If you have dialed in through your phone, go ahead and dial star nine to raise your hand. Again, that's star nine. Um, if you're using the Zoom app, the raise your hand function is on the lower right hand corner. If you're on your computer and it's a PC, uh, you can use the keyboard shortcut Alt-Y. Again, that's Alt-Y. And if you're on your Mac, you can use Option-Y. Again, that's Option-Y. And that's to raise your hand. Um, throughout this meeting, we will um, have you uh, comment, but um, we encourage you to raise your hand before you speak. Um, now, we would encourage you to raise your hand, and it's only if you have a vision disability or have experienced vision loss. Um, this will help our meeting moderator, Matt, um, to make a note of this on your name within Zoom so that we know um, who to prioritize during our discussion later on in the meeting. And if you raise your hand, you have a vision disability or experienced vision loss, we would very much appreciate it.
And keep them up, please. Yeah, I can um, explain how to find the raised hand. If you're using, um, if you're on your computer and if you're looking through the participants window, which you can open up um, on the bottom. Once you open the participant window, look at the very bottom, there's three tiny dots um, and you should be able to click raise hand through there. Um, it also may be easier just to use a keyboard shortcut. If you're on a PC, you can do Alt Y. And if you're on a Mac, you can do option Y. And if you have dialed on your phone, you can dial star nine. We appreciate everyone raising their hand. If you do have vision disability, um, we are renaming you in Zoom to help with our conversation later on in our meeting. Excellent. So as I was saying, we appreciate everyone raising their hand later on in the meeting so that um, we know that you would like to speak. Um, once we see your raised hand, we can call on your name and we will then have to unmute you. Um, as we said before, everyone enters the meeting muted, um, so we must unmute you before you could talk. Um, the easiest way to do that is the uh, meeting host, which will be me, um, will go ahead and unmute you. And this can happen either if you are using a computer or have dialed in. Um, if you request uh, to speak and I choose you, um, I will go ahead and unmute you and you must accept this request. Um, this looks like a small window that says the host will like you to unmute and you can go ahead and press the enter button to um, be able to speak. And similarly, if you're on your phone, um, you will get a message saying the host will like you to unmute. Um, and you can go ahead and dial star six, and that will enable you to speak to the group. There are a couple other ways you could unmute yourself if um, needed. We would prefer um, the meeting host to unmute you, but if you do need um, to know, there uh, you can dial star six if you're on your telephone. Um, if you're on your Zoom app, you can click unmute or mute on the lower left-hand corner, similarly with the um, computer platform. If you're on a PC, you can use the keyboard shortcut Alt-A, and if you're on a Mac, use Command-Shift-A. Um, we'd appreciate seeing all of your beautiful faces if you are um, willing to. Uh, so we do encourage you to turn your video on during this meeting. Um, you can do that by clicking the start video button on the bottom left of your screen. Uh, the keyboard shortcuts include Alt V for um, PC and Command Shift V for Mac. And again, um, if you're willing, we'd appreciate uh, your video. Thank you. Any questions again, um, please go ahead and use the chat function. Um, which I see some now. And that's all I for me. Uh, thank you, Katie. Um, one second, let me just change the spotlight. So I'm back on the screen here. And we did get a, I did get a chat from uh, Donna um, about the, the Zoom does not allow hosts to unmute people. That's true. I, we cannot unmute you without your consent, but we can we can request that you unmute yourself. You also have that ability. So if you raise your hand, we will say um, you know, you're welcome to unmute yourself and speak now. But if you're having trouble, we can we can send a, a message to you saying we would like you to unmute. So that's that's to be clear, we cannot unmute you without your consent. I just want to introduce a few um, of the people who are here tonight. Um, again, to repeat, my name is Matt Johnson, and I'm a project manager with the Montgomery County Department of Transportation. Uh, we also have with us from um, MCDOT, we have Hannah Hen and Darcy Buckley. Um, Pat Shepard is also here. She's our bikeways coordinator. She's here to observe. Um, from tool design, uh, we have uh, Jim Elliott, uh, who is the project manager on the consultant side. We also have um, 
uh, Ken Ray and uh, Katie Heuser, who you just you just met. Uh, Mary Beth Cleveland is with us um, as well, and she's going to have some slides to go through later uh, in the presentation. And then from the Montgomery County Department of Health and Human Services, we have uh, Betsy Looking and uh, Sean Brennan. So thank you all to everyone who's helping us uh, facilitate this, this meeting tonight. And again, thank you uh, to all of you who are, um, are here tonight uh, as guests. We don't have time to introduce all of you, but again, we would like you to introduce yourself as, if it's the first time you're speaking. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just to introduce the project, um, and again, I mentioned some of this at the beginning, but we got a scope from the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments to undertake a study of how the county and other jurisdictions can improve wayfinding and safety for people who have a vision disability. Uh, and the result of this project is going to be a toolkit of treatments for how we can better serve people who have vision disabilities. Um, it will also include a 30% design for a pilot project in Silver Spring. Now we have not identified the location of where that pilot project in Silver Spring is going to be yet. Uh, that is part of this uh, process. So as we go through the process, we're gonna ask you to give us some feedback. I don't just mean tonight, I mean through the, through the entire process um, about maybe where that could be, where would you like to see those improvements? Um, and the toolkit will be used not just in Montgomery County, but it's designed so that it can be used throughout the region. So potentially we could have some, some more standardized treatments uh, across, across the border, because I know that just like uh, me, all of you are not only in Montgomery County, you also travel across borders to, to Washington, DC, um, to Virginia, to other counties in Maryland. So um, one other um, thing to note is the project, the completion date for the project is June of 2021. Our grant agreement requires us to have completed the project by then. So this is a pretty quick project. Uh, and over the next six months, we're gonna be working very hard to create this toolkit and the pilot design. Next slide, please. Um, so just some context and background, um, we were inspired to apply for this grant um, based on some feedback that we got from the Commission on People with Disabilities and some other county residents uh, related to the installation of floating bus stops in Silver Spring. Um, that was one of the primary uh, genesis of this project. Um, we also, as a county, have adopted Vision Zero, which is an effort, uh, a goal um, to reduce injuries and, and fatalities on our roadways to zero. Uh, by 2030. Um, people with disabilities are among the most vulnerable users on our roads, and we really do need to take special care uh, to, to design the roads in ways that improve safety and mobility for uh, people who have those uh, visual disabilities and, and other disabilities. So we are also committed to uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and creating alternatives to travel um, by car is a key part of reducing um, greenhouse gas emissions. So we're trying to find ways to introduce uh, more uh, friendly pedestrian and bicycle facilities as part of that part of that goal. So those are all. That's all context for um, the project. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and I think uh, Jim or Mary Beth, I think this is your section. Yes, this is my section. Hi everybody, I'm Mary Beth Cleveland, and I'll be talking about different types of vision loss and how people with vision loss navigate. My goal is to help the sighted people understand a little bit more about how the inability to access certain visual information can affect safety and navigation. But for the people here with vision loss, I hope it gets you thinking about what works for you in the environment and what does not work so that you can share that later in the meeting. So next slide, we're gonna talk about types of vision loss. There's a photo on the right hand side with a person wearing a black backpack walking away. She's on a wide urban sidewalk. She's got a white cane in her left hand and a support cane in her right hand. There are many misconceptions about blindness. Um, one is that all people who are blind read braille, but one that is even more common is that people who use white canes or guide dogs are totally blind. And the truth is that 85% of people with a vision disability have some remaining vision. Legal blindness is defined as having a visual acuity, acuity meaning the sharpness of 20 over 200 in the best eye with best correction. That's with glasses. So for what a person sees at, for what a 2020 person sees at 
200 feet, the person with 20 over 200 would need to be at 20 feet. Now there are some people who have better than 20 over 200 vision and are legally blind due to their visual field restrictions down to 20 degrees. But vision loss can be difficult to define for some people because they can experience fluctuating vision depending on the light or the environment. A person can function very well during the day, but as soon as the sun goes down, they might find navigating very challenging. I also have on the slide um, the IRA app vision simulator. You can put that on your phone and it teaches about different types of visual issues and demonstrates them through the phone on your camera or the, through the camera on your phone. Next slide, we're gonna go through various types of vision loss. Uh, Mary Beth, bef before you go on, we do have one person with their hand up. Um, so uh, Kirsta, um, if you would like to unmute yourself and, and give us your question. And if you can't unmute yourself, we can, uh, we can do that. Did you have a question? Kirsta? Okay, maybe looks like Krista put her hand down. So uh, go ahead, Mary Beth. Might've been from earlier. Okay, so we're starting with this slide with, with which is overall acuity loss. Um, this image is a faded unfocused photo. The bottom part of the frame shows a white sand color and a large reddish rectangle. A small black rectangle is found to the left of the reddish rectangle. There's some dark vertical lines scattered throughout the photo. Some are short, some are tall. And there's a blurry white triangle located on the left side and one on the right. This photo is very difficult to know what it is. People often tell me when they look around, they see colored blobs like we see in this photo. But if I said you can hear birds, traffic sounds, traffic sounds and people milling around, you might be able to make a guess as to what we're looking at. Next slide. The next slide is peripheral visual loss. This is actually the same photo that we had before, but the image is a dark gray opaque rectangle with an abstract shape opening in the middle. Through the opening are people gathering in the distance. A small white and blue tent canopy is in the distance. This person has 20-20 vision, but he's experiencing peripheral vision loss, making it difficult to see anything that is not found directly in front of him. People who experience peripheral visual loss often have trouble traveling in dim lighting as well. Next slide is central vision loss. In contrast to the previous slide, this person is experiencing this person has peripheral or side vision, but has an occlusion in the center. So this is a, a photo with a blur of colors. There's including white, reddish brown, black, and a sand color, but the photo has a dark circular obstruction in the center. So this could be an example of macular degeneration or star garts. The sharpness of vision is missing, so it makes it very difficult to read. And this person cannot look around that dark spot in the middle. The next slide is color blindness. This is an, the same image, but now we see that it's a full courtyard. The colors are dimmed. People stand and sit in the center around tent style canopies. There are various waist high pillars throughout the courtyard. Tall buildings are in the background and trees flank the courtyard. Red and green is the most common type of color blindness. So an example of someone that might have difficulty with color blindness is maybe reading the Metro map um, because we name our trains in colors. Next slide. This is total vision loss. This is just an image of a dark gray opaque rectangle, but this could easily have been um, a white rectangle. This person would still obviously benefit from the sound of the birds, the people milling around, the distant traffic sounds to determine something about the environment. The next slide is normal vision. Again, we've got a photo of a courtyard, same photo. Um, the colors are more bright. People are still standing and sitting in the center around blue and white tent style canopies. The pillars um, are there in the courtyard. The tall buildings are in the background and trees flank the courtyard. 
this is how someone with 2020 vision would see. But now when you look at this, we can probably identify what someone with a vision loss, how they might use their vision, but how they might find it difficult to rely only on their vision. The next slide, night blindness. This is a photo that's very dark. There's several, several orange circles that are bright scattered throughout the photo. Some people experience difficulty traveling in dim light. In dim light, visual landmarks used in brighter settings are now missing. Color contrast is reduced at night and even at dusk. But because of the light, like in this photo, we see the light shining. It might be easier to see traffic lights or crosswalk lights. Next slide. Pedestrians with low vision. Depth perception is a problem for so many people. Depth perception is the ability to perceive the world in three dimensions and judge the distance of an object. In order to have depth perception, you need binocular vision. So if one eye is affected, even if that other eye is perfect, it can mean difficulty judging steps, judging location and speed of traffic. And this is crucial in street crossings, especially if it's uncontrolled crossings. Low vision is also reduced contrast sensitivity. Someone may have trouble distinguishing a hole from a shadow or a dark patch on the ground. And vision fluctuates a lot during the day due to lighting, going from outside to inside or vice versa. Um, maybe going from a shady area to uh, the brightness. Reading signs can be difficult, but for people like with peripheral vision loss, just locating the sign can also be very difficult. Um, next slide. How pedestrians travel. This is not determined by the type of vision loss. There's other factors that come into play. Has this person had training? Training can improve confidence and skill and ability Someone newly diagnosed might be more afraid to move around than someone who was born with a visual disability. Other factors might include health, stamina. Some people have vision loss and hearing loss. Some have neuropathy and they may have difficulty detecting different types of surfaces. Some people walk with a support cane. Some people walk with a walker. Some use a wheelchair to navigate. Goals can also vary from getting safe, safely to your mailbox, going to work, going to the store, riding public transportation, different personalities also. Some people are more adventurous, some are more timid, some people are outgoing, some are shy, and different household dynamics. Not just family support, but where people live. Do they have easy access to the community? To public transportation, or do they live in a more of a residential area? Next slide. Orientation and mobility. Orientation and mobility is a specific type of training to people with a visual disability. It was created out of a need because people with vision loss required more specific training to learn how to access environmental information without sight. It's for anyone at any age. I am an orientation mobility specialist, O&M specialist, and I have worked with people as young as two. And right now I have someone who's 97 years old, so it ranges. O&M is in two parts. Mobility is the ability to get around. So we're gonna start with the M. Next slide for mobility. Mobility includes in mobility, a person uses visual skills and various low vision aids. Low vision aids can be as simple as wearing a hat or a visor or sunglasses to reduce the glare, but can also be something like a handheld telescope to read signs or even apps on the phone that use the camera to read the signs. It's using human guide, canes, dogs, technology. Uh, crossing streets, of course, is involved and using public transportation. Next slide. Using visual skills. 
So learning how to scan and use that information to navigate safely. When people, or people have sometimes have a big fear of falling. So finding something like a handrail or a yellow ramp or the dark edge of the grass against the sidewalk is important to help somebody say, stay safe. Another fear is being able just to get where you wanna go. So a visual clue could be people gathered at a corner could mean a bus stop. Or if you're looking for the metro station, you might notice a, a long line of newspaper stands. Or that sort of dark hole could, in, in, um, could indicate the entrance to the metro station. The next slide, another type of mobility is using the human guide. This is holding onto a person's arm to get around safely. There's a photo on this slide. It's a, a photo of a woman linking arms with another woman as they walk down an urban sidewalk. The person being guided can either offer directions to the guide or they might need help with their orientation. In the next slide, we talk about the cane, the white cane as a tool. The cane is used to locate obstacles, landmarks, surface changes and steps. It's also used as a tool to cross streets to alert drivers. They might not see the car coming. This slide has a photo of people crossing in the crosswalk on a busy downtown street. One of the people has a visual disability and is using a cane. Next slide. This slide talks about cane techniques and tips. People use different types of um, canes and different types, types of tips, different techniques. Some people use a more of a tactile approach and sweep the cane tip in a constant contact with the ground. This offers immediate information on terrain changes, but also sound changes. This person might use a rolling marshmallow tip or a rolling ball tip. On the right hand side of the sl slide, we have pictures of different kinds of cane tips. Starting from left to right, we have a marshmallow tip, then a ball tip, a pencil tip, and then a metal glide tip. Some people use touch technique. So by tapping the cane left and right, but the cane tip is raised above the ground in between the two touches. This person might be using sound to navigate, or maybe they just want to move a little faster. Someone who uses sound might use a metal tip to hear sound changes such as buildings or op openings, which this could be a form of echolocation. Next slide is about using the dog as a tool. Unlike the cane, the dog avoids obstacles. So the landmarks used by a, someone who uses a dog would be very different than someone who uses a cane. There's a photo on the slide. The person in the photo is walking with his guide dog. He's walking behind a bus shelter and he might be using the sound, the, the um, person who's walking might be using the sound the sound change of the shelter as a landmark so he knows where he is. He can also teach the dog how to locate that bus stop as a landmark. Next slide. Skills needed to cross the street. Now there's a lot of skills um, people learn when crossing a street and it's very different when you're visually impaired um, than when you're sighted. I just learned how to turn my head, look left and right when I was learning how to cross streets. But when you have um, vision loss, it's more skills involved. You have to identify the location of a street, interpret the traffic using visual information and sounds, determine the type of traffic control, stop sign, traffic light, locate the crosswalk button if there is one. You need to learn how to line up, determine when it is safe to cross, initiate that crossing, staying aligned when crossing, and knowing how to recover from veering if you veer outside the crosswalk. And then identify when you have reached the other side of the street. Next slide.
staying aligned during crossing. I'm sorry, this is ways to identify a street corner. A person needs to identify that they're on a street corner because without knowing, it's possible to begin crossing a street without even realizing you're doing so. So it's important to identify that you're on a corner and some corners can be very difficult when they're round. A person might not even realize he's going around a corner and may wonder what's happened to the street crossing that he's looking for. Clues used to identify a street corner include the sidewalk getting wider, where the two sidewalks at the corner meet up. In urban areas, if walking near a building line, the building line rarely goes all the way to the corner. So someone might hear the open space when it drops away or feel the wind pick up, or maybe the shadow of the building goes away. They reach the curb or the slope, or maybe they hear the beep, beep, beep of the accessible pedestrian signal. Next slide. Lining up to cross. Skill, a lot of skills are needed for lining up to cross. Um, on this um, slide, we have a photo. It's a very large corner. There's a large red brick sidewalk and a light colored ramp. There's a yellow detectable warning surface, but the ramp points into the direction of the intersection and the crosswalks flank the ramp. People need to learn how to interpret the traffic when they're lining up. When evaluating the traffic and lining up, the visual and auditory information can be used, but a person needs to consider if the street is wide or maybe it's angled. So lining up is very difficult. It can be difficult to figure out what to do if you're using the ramp that's in this photo. People can also use the tactile arrow on the uh, accessible pedestrian signal that can help with alignment, but sometimes the person has to use that arrow and then go back down to the corner and kind of get realigned. There's other clues available like a grass line or a curb and the presence of a ramp is helpful, but it's not, hel not helpful at all to use the ramp to line up. The tactile um, bumps on the ramp, the yellow bumps on the ramp, they are not used for alignment. It's just to alert the traveler that they're in an area where cars might be present since they step off those bumps. Next slide. Staying aligned during crossing. This is how a person with vision loss can navigate an open space. It's difficult but understanding and using the flow of the parallel traffic is one of the keys. Using crosswalk lines when available, the movement of the other pedestrians or the sound of the APS on the other side of the street can help you stay aligned. Um, it's also helpful if you know if you're veering. And in this photo, we have a, a crosswalk across several lanes of traffic. There are multiple cars lined up on the far side of the crosswalk as a construction site and tall buildings found in the distance. But this is a wide space and could be very difficult to stay aligned for that entire crossing. Next slide. Concentration required. So that was mobility and that's a lot. Mobility skills require a lot of concentration to be safe. But now we need to think about where we're going, which is an added level of concentration required. Next slide. So orientation, the O part of O&M, asks the questions, where am I? Where am I going? How will I get there? We're all familiar with GPS, but we don't use that everywhere we go. Different types of travelers may use different types of cues in their environment. Next slide. Are we there yet? How does someone with vision loss stay oriented? Using visual clues, like for their home, can include painting their mailbox bright yellow. Somebody could use tactile clues. Someone might detect a wooden fence with their cane just before they reach their destination. So they can use that clue to return back or to find the location again later. And I know right now touching things is very scary because of COVID. 
but without the good visual information, this can be a necessary way to get information. Auditory cues. Sounds in the environment are very helpful, such as your neighbor's barking dog. Traffic sounds. Some streets are very busy all the time and some are quiet. So if a person was walking on a busy street and then realized it became quiet, that might be a clue that something went wrong with their route. Next slide. Olfactory is the sense of smell. So this might be difficult if anybody has lost their sense of smell because of COVID. But I had one lady tell me that she could always find Starbucks by the smell of burnt coffee. Memory. Without the visual information, people with vision loss find they need to memorize their landmarks and when to turn. This is an added requirement for observation and concentration. Technology can really help, especially when our memory feels too full. I know I've used my own cell phone when I'm looking for my, my car I recorded in my phone. There are many apps with, that people with vision loss use such as apps that use the camera and either a real person on the other end to help or maybe artificial intelligence. There are GPS tools specifically for people with visual disabilities. Personally, I like using Siri and saying, where am I? Just to find the name of the street that I'm on. But sometimes you can push that APS, the accessible pedestrian signal that, and it will announce the name of the street. Next slide. Generalizing the environment. We have to make an educated guess with common characteristics. So when you locate a handrail, what does that mean? This is a predictability that we all rely on. When moving around, we look for and use predictability and commonalities. So the next slide, we talk about locating an unfamiliar bus stop. People with vision loss don't always stick to the same familiar routes. They like to go places that they have never been before and it does require some guessing. It helps to plan ahead, but that's not always possible. You can use apps and electronic travel aids, but to find an unfamiliar bus stop, you can make an educated guess by generalizing. Some bus stops are, or bus stops are often actually 10 to 20 feet from a corner Maybe there's a landing pad, then an extension of the sidewalk that goes to the curb. Maybe there's a shelter. Um, the bus stops will have a bus stop pull, and in, in this county, they look a certain way. They're not usually round, but they're also the same shape, like a no parking sign. So I hope that got you thinking about how people with vision loss might navigate, but um, the challenges that people face when they're navigating. All right. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, I'm Jim Elliott from Tool Design. Matt, did you, were you, uh, did somebody have a question? Uh, we don't have any hands up right now, but uh, okay. it's, now's a good chance to ask and see if, if there is anybody. If you want to uh, raise your hand again, you can do that by pressing Alt-Y or dialing star nine. I'm not seeing any hands. Okay, I, I just thought I heard somebody breaking in there. Oh, we do have a hand now. Sorry. Um, looks like the phone number is uh, ends in uh, 5301. You, wanna, you can unmute yourself and uh, ask your question if your phone number ends in 5301. Let me see if... Uh, go ahead. Yeah, um, this is Brett Roulier. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Brett. Go ahead. Um, I just had a uh, question on slide 41, which shows a corner ramp that you uh, talked about. I think it would be a much better idea for you to limit the use of corner ramps, um, and that would av avoid the problem of, of the curb ramp misaligning with the sidewalk, with the crosswalk, rather than try and put the uh, onus on the pedestrian um, to deal with a corner ramp. That's all. Thank you, Brett. That's a, uh, that's a really good point. And I think the, the point of Mary Beth's slides was to talk about 
how blind and low vision people have to navigate what's out there. And the fact of the matter is, is that that ramp is there and there are many places like that. So, uh, but we, I think pretty much universally on, on this call would agree with you that those are not ideal and we would probably not build something like that today if we could avoid it. Um, sometimes there are geometric constraints and intersections that make it difficult to have ramps at right angles. Um, but, but again, Mary Beth's presentation was talking about what's out there now. And I think we're going to get into um, how to make it better or later on in the presentation. Right. Uh, yeah. So the next part. We have one more question, Jim. We have a question from the phone number ending in 5496. And then after that, we're going to go on with the presentation and we can handle questions later. So uh, if your phone number ends in 5496, you can unmute yourself again by dialing uh, star six and go ahead. Tom Bickford, I am a blind cane traveler. I recognize and have had problems with ramps, but they are also very helpful to people who use uh, wheeled aids and for people who push grocery carts, uh, child carrying devices, things like that. So it is part of the life. And we just have to learn how to get along with them. Thanks. Thank you. All right, Jim, go ahead with your slides. Okay, yeah. So um, the next part of the meeting is going to focus on, on your feedback and specifically on the challenges people with vision disabilities face navigating uh, urban environments in Montgomery County. We especially want to hear from people who have some kind of vision loss that affects their navigation as a pedestrian. So it's really great to hear those of you who have already spoken up. Um, we're interested in people who are blind and people who have low vision and others who may not consider themselves as having a disability, but nevertheless have difficulty seeing in certain situations or times of day. We'd also like to hear from orientation and mobility specialists and others who have a deep fam familiarity with the challenges people with vision disabilities face when navigating urban environments. We'd specifically like feedback on navigation challenges related to sidewalks, intersections and crossings, separated bike lanes and floating bus stops, and other public spaces. We'll take up each topic in sequ sequential order beginning with sidewalks. We ask that if you have comments that are primary, primarily related to one topic that you reserve them until that topic comes up. For example, if you'd like to relay feedback on separated bike lanes and floating bus stops, we ask that you wait until the floating bus stop question comes up before raising your hand. A few additional notes on how we're going to manage this part of the meeting. Please use the Zoom raise hand feature that Katie talked about earlier to indicate that you are interested in speaking. You can also use the chat feature if that works better for you. Katie will read out your chat messages after we go through all of the verbal responses. We'll prioritize feedback from people who have a vision disability or vision loss, and then move on to specialists and others. If you have a vision disability or vision loss, please say a little bit about the type of vision disability or vision loss you have. For example, you might say something like, hi, this is Jane Doe. I have, a low vision, I have low vision and use a long white cane for navigation. If you are a specialist, please say so. If you are affiliated with a group or organization in Montgomery County, please indicate your affiliation. Finally, please keep your comments as concise as possible. We want to hear from as many of you as possible tonight. We've set aside five to 15 minutes for each topic. I'll indicate exactly how much when we get to each question slide. Don't worry if you have a comment and we aren't able to fit it in given time constraints. We'll provide additional opportunities for feedback over the course of the project, including a survey we plan to send out later this week. It's now time for our first question, which is what do you find challenging about navigating sidewalks in Montgomery County? We've set aside 10 minutes for your response to this question. As a reminder, you can raise your hand on the phone by dialing star nine on your computer, use the shortcut Alt Y. So 
So we have um, Ansel Torres uh, has, uh, has a hand up. Uh, Ansel, and I apologize if I'm pronouncing that name wrong, but uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your, your comment. Yes, hello? Yeah, we can hear you, go ahead. Excellent. Um, yes, I live in downtown Silver Spring. I'm totally blind. And um, over the past year or so, I have been engaged in, uh, well, let's just say hyperactivism with uh, the county council, the Montgomery County Council, um, the, also the county attorney on several issues having to do with uh, navigating the sidewalk in downtown Silver Spring. Um, there's, there are so many, I think you said I should reserve my comments to 30 seconds. Uh, I think I'm, I'll, 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 I, well, okay, my 30 seconds are probably up by now. But anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll get to them as quickly as I possibly can. Uh, for one thing, I, I came from New York City. Uh, navigating in New York City, I, I use a white cane and I use it here as well. Um, and, and the comparison is when I, when I came here, I was surprised as to how many of the sidewalks in downtown Silver Spring have all kinds of street signs and obstacles literally in the middle of the sidewalk. Uh, in New York City, I, I don't remember that being much of a problem. That's one. Uh, another is there is, a, there is a street corner right there uh, at the corner of uh, Colesville Road and Fenton Street. Um, I believe that would be uh, the north, I'm sorry, the south west side corner, which is the side with the mall, the corner with the mall. The sidewalk there is completely flat. So it's very difficult for me to figure out, wait, am I in the street or, or did I get off the sidewalk? I have never seen a sidewalk like that anywhere in the world. And I have, I have done some travel. Um, I don't know why it is like that. Um, it's, it's, I, I strongly would encourage the county to do something about that or maybe you could do something about that in your project I don't know but the biggest uh, confrontation and the biggest problem that I've had and this is a problem that does not normally come up in many of these kinds of forums but it's in downtown Silver Spring at the corner of Fenton and Ellsworth uh, you have quite a number of buskers uh, that perform at the street corner and it's a problem. Basically what happens is that they crank up the volume of their amplifier very loud. So even if there are uh, audio cues that you're supposed to be listening to, whether it's on the, on the street, on the uh, traffic light, uh, the traffic signal pole, um, or just hearing the traffic, which also is, is an important cue for when you're crossing the street, or even just hearing people talk and walk, because that helps me to stay uh, within uh, the, the path that I'm supposed to walk, because at that intersection, you also have a bit of an angle, um, and those, those are a little bit tricky. So it's not, a, it's not a simple straight walk. You sort of have to make sure you angle yourself appropriately, otherwise you end off, off track. Um, I have been appealing to the county to uh, find a way to restrict that level of noise disturbance at the intersection. There is a county ordinance that says that you're not supposed to make so much noise that uh, interferes with the safety of others. It's on the books. And they seem to just ignore the law. And it's almost like I feel like I have to file a lawsuit in order for them, in order to get the county to follow their own laws. And I find that very disturbing. There's much more that I have to say, but I will, st I will stop there for now. Thanks. Uh, well, thank you for the, those comments, um, Ansel. It's a, a lot of information and I think it's, it's really good, really good, good information for us to, to hear. Uh, our, our next commenter with their hand up is uh, Christy Smith. Um, so Christy, if you could uh, go ahead and speak. Hi, uh, my name is Christy Smith. Um, I have albinism, approximately 2400 vision, and I use a guide dog. 
from Guide Dogs for the Blind in California. Um, I would like to echo everything the previous commenter said um, that all resonates with me very strongly. Um, I would like to add that sidewalks are difficult if the concrete or bricks are uneven. Um, this a lot of times happens around trees um, with tree roots breaking them up um, and that uh, can be a very difficult place to navigate. If you're using a cane, the cane gets trapped there um, and it's just a tripping hazard. Um, there are also often small gates around trees. If there are little um, dirt enclosures around the tree, there's a little gate there. And those are also a uh, hazard and just frankly an inconvenience. Um, canes get stuck in them. And then if you're using a guide dog, especially in a dense urban environment, there are very few places to relieve your guide dog. And it can be very difficult to find one of those. And so there have been many times that my guide dog has had to hop a fence around a tree. Um, and that can put me in uh, danger because then the guide dog is trying to pull and I may not know how high the gate is, if I can step over it, if they're, what's safe on the other side because the guide dog is kind of off duty at that moment. Um, so that's what I would add. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Christy. Um, I'm going to lower your hand. Uh, next up, um, we have Bridget uh, Doherty. Uh, you can go ahead and speak, please. Hi, thanks. Uh, this is Bridget. I'm an orientation and mobility specialist. I work with Metro, have been there for 12 plus years now. I also am blind. I have a small amount of tunnel vision at this, some of what the others have said with the sidewalk uh, issues, in, especially in terms of how the gaps can grab at your cane. We are all used to, in some respects, this, no matter where we are. Um, and part of what, uh, going back to what Mary Beth said in her presentation, which was wonderful, um, the training piece, the uh, learning of mobility is so important so that when we are walking down sidewalks and encountering these difficulties, uh, we've had the training that we can sort of take a breath and figure out our next step steps and make a plan. One of my pet peeves is, is the um, folks who are leaving the scooters uh, on the sidewalks. And I know that Montgomery County has uh, made an effort or is making an effort to um, address that concern, but I wanted to raise that here. I think that's a real problem, not just for those of us who are blind or have low vision, but for any pedestrian on the, on the sidewalk. Um, and the other piece is that there are times when uh, Mr. Torres was speaking of the uh, signage, that in addition to the signage uh, and the scooters and perhaps the gate around the trees, sometimes it just becomes so narrow. The pathway becomes narrow that not only for us, but I, I uh, know as someone who at one point for a time had to use a, a power wheelchair, it can also affect the accessible pathway for others. So in the interest of universal design, the, all of those um, issues sort of coalesce into let's keep the pathway free. Really glad you all are doing this meeting. Thanks. Thank you. Um, next up we have um, Day al Mohammed. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Dale Muhammad. I am visually impaired. Um, I am speaking as an individual, but I am actually also on Montgomery County Commission for People with Disabilities. And so I know this is these are things that have come up um, quite a bit uh, in several of our meetings. I'm gonna stick to just sidewalks also. Um, and I'm gonna end up paralleling a little bit of what was said right before me. And that is, um, I love the examples what you're talking about. Those are, those are a lot of the general kinds of obstacles and 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 things that, and challenges that folks with visual impairments face, such as myself. Um, one of the things I would like to highlight are the the non permanent obstacles that show up a lot, and those are things like those e scooters without corrals that are bikes that are left. Uh, because currently, right now, there's not really a penalty and there's not really an incentive either end to be a, for folks to 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 follow through on that. Um, so that that's just. It's one of these kinds of air quotes, temporary things that suddenly can pop up. Uh, construction, 
and making sure that is clearly marked is another one. And um, the third one, which is one of those temporary things sort of that pops up, which I think is going to become a bigger issue going forward that we should pay attention to, is um, how many eateries in downtown Silver Spring are engaging in outdoor eating and outdoor seating, and how much of that is going to increase um, as things are changing, and how often is that that has been a problem because of where things are and they're constantly moving. So, so some of the more, um, I guess, movable obstacles that show up and what's being done to enforce and ensure that the, that the sidewalk space, that a clear pathway continues to remain. Uh, Cause I know that tends to become problematic after a bit. All right, thank you. Um, Debbie Brown, do you want to unmute yourself and okay. go ahead? Yes, um, I'm blind and I use a, a, a white cane and there are uh, most of what everybody has said I certainly agree with um, just the additional things that I want to bring up is that we make sure that people have places to go in the first place um, that we, we need to build more spaces that are pedestrian friendly in the first place that a person can get to at should not have to cross miles of, it feels like miles, of parking lot to get to um, shopping areas and all that. And when a bus stop is goes to a mall, it ought to get to somewhere close to the mall and not have to, you know, you can't even find, you don't even know where the stores are because there are, are just, the sidewalk doesn't even align with it. It's just full of parking lots. I mean, I find... Um, the bus stop at Montgomery Mall, that's, if you're, you're, you're nowhere, nowhere near the mall, we, you have to cross this perimeter lane with no light um, to get to um, the shopping center. Um, and at uh, places uh, like a con congressional plaza, like you are, you've got to cross a whole large parking area between the sidewalk where you would get either off the bus or from the metro at two. So that that's um, another one of the issues that I don't know, you're gonna, you're, you're not gonna get very far in this project. And I know that you're they're here for a particular issue. Um, and, uh, but Montgomery County just could make the whole county, instead of thinking about walkable communities, you need to think about a completely walkable county. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, Jim, how are we doing on time? We are at about 10 minutes for this topic, which is the time limit, limit we set on it. So I think it's, I think we should probably move on. And if there are additional comments, um, perhaps we can, we can take them up later. Okay. Can I speak to one, one, a couple of those things that we, that you brought up? Sure, go ahead. Very quickly, um, I think I've seen solutions to some of those because all of those things uh, resonate with me, um, and and I've certainly I grew up in this area, and I really liked um, everything that people have said. The sidewalk issues have I've seen some solutions to those, um, not so much the um, the level. Uh, the level walking spaces, but I do like the idea that of encouraging more people to walk. And those of us with visual impairments, my name is Kirsta, and um, I have a number of those visual impairments. Um, I have low vision, I'm visually impaired, um, I have fluctuating vision because of um, uh, uh, um, I, I was uh, diagnosed when I was quite young. And so it's um, a, um, a it's fluctuating because my my vision has is deteriorating over the years so um i lose quite a bit over you know each year i've lost more and more i i walk with a guide dog i i also walk with a cane and so i i trip um often on those uneven areas and those areas that have been smoothed down and opened up have been done a lot with um, landscaping as people want you to walk more. They've done landscaping, which gives us a path, a wider path and something clearer, as long as it's made clearer. And some landscaping is done with, um, with grassy areas. And those are very much appreciated by those of us with dogs. Also with a cane, um, when it's easier to follow, they're wider and easier to follow. So that kind of speaks to some of those of us 
who you know have asked for those spaces. Same thing with the parking lots. There have been some parking lots. Um, one of them is near me. I'm trying to think of the name of it, but uh, there's a giant. There's a lot of strip areas. They're very nice ones, but strip areas with um, a lot of shops and a couple of big stores and um, I think a giant. And they've they've constructed from the area of where the bus stops um, to through the shopping areas. They've they've constructed some some walkways, and they've also constructed some. Basically, they're they're not very fancy um, um, areas that that have some landscaping, but it allows us to walk along them and, and get to all of the stores and to the walkways uh, along the store. We can follow the pathways and I don't think it's that difficult to create those but that gives us a, a solution construction is another problem for us all of us but as long as as something even temporary was created that was smooth if they don't create a smooth pathway and there's rough um, loose gravel things like that that's a big problem um, I've taken some re really serious falls from those and I think you know, that's something the county would, would have a big problem with, those of us that, that um, have, have difficulties with that. So that's just a few suggestions that I had that might solve some of those temporary and long-term problems that, that all of us are facing. So um, for what it's worth, you know, I think you've solved some of the problems, but just some attention to those issues would, um, would, would solve some of the, the uh, problems that, that we're facing. That's all I had to say. All right. Thank you, Kirsten. We're, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next question, but we will, if we have time at the end, we will come back to uh, let people chime in on things that we've already talked okay. about. Okay. I, I had to leave, so I wanted to make sure I said something. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Jim, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, so our second question is, what do you find challenging about navigating intersections and crossings in Montgomery County? And by that, we mean street intersections and mid-block crossings. We've set aside 10 minutes for your responses to this question. Once again, you can raise your hand on the phone by dialing star nine on your computer. Use the shortcut Alt-Y. So uh, Liliana Gillespie, you had your hand up from before. Did you, ha did you also have a comment about um, intersections and crossings? If you do, you can go ahead and speak to that. Um, I had a question, or I guess an answer regarding the last question. Um, I don't really have anything on this one. Okay, well, why don't we, you hold that, uh, keep that in, in your, your mind, and we'll come back to it if we have time at the end. So thank you. I'm going to go ahead and put your hand down for now. Thank you. Um, Cindy LeBon, you have your hand up. Did you want to talk about intersections and crossings? Uh, and you're, you're on mute, Cindy. Okay, now I'm not on mute. Yes, go ahead. And I, okay, this is so ironic. I'm glad you came up with this question. I was going to mention it in the previous, and... Let me say this. This is ironic. Ten years ago today, I attended a meeting at the Wheaton Library about um, crossing streets, pedestrian signals, etc. Well, newsflash. Ten years later today, I used the um, intersection at Muddy Branch Road and Diamond Back Avenue. Now, we had the old signal in there that was put in in the early 90s. And I was so excited, and I mean, yes, I was, I was thrilled to death, when in 20, after me complaining several hundred times, um, they put in the new pedestrian signal. It worked for about three months. So, last week, this is so funny, I am, I have a guide dog, Gardenia, from Guiding Eyes for the Blind. And last week, because the um, trainers cannot come down to help assist us in renewing our uh, guide application, I went out with uh, somebody to do a video of my walking and crossing at Muddy Branch and Diamond. So as we're walking up the street at Muddy Branch, you hear ding. Now, to be honest with you, this pedestrian signal they put in is not near the corner, okay? So today I did my phone interview and the trainer said, what was that ding? Don't they have a signal? That corner is so busy. I said, oh yeah, but it's in 10 years. And she looked back and saw in 
May 23rd, 2011, when I, or 2012, I'm sorry, because I lost my vision at the middle of 2011, um, I did a, a walk with Del Rodman from Guiding Eyes. We complained to Montgomery County about the signal then not working, the new signal not working. And I want somebody to come out and physically meet me at that intersection. Now, fortunately, my dog being the diva that she is, and Mary Beth knows she worked with me before I got my dog in mobility and worked with me when I brought the dog home on that corner and the bus stop. And that was my first dog. And um, she's good. And she mastered that corner last week perfectly. However, it's not, it's not a safe corner. It's very noisy and loud. It would be nice to have a signal by the corner, not halfway down the Muddy Branch Road towards, um, what's that, Great Seneca. It'd be nice to have it where I, we cross. I want someone to physically meet me so they can see exactly what I'm talking about. Um, the corner is, there's always accidents. And I'm sorry, but it is not safe. So um, fortunately, my guide dog has survived eight and a half years that I've had her. She'll be 10 next week. But um, getting a new dog, I don't want to have to battle it out again. Just saying, that's my take. Well, well thank you, Cindy. And I will, uh, I'll reach out to our signals team and see if we can't get someone to, to be out yeah, there. Yeah, well, I've heard that one before, like probably seven or eight times. So you can get in touch with me. You know where I am. All right. Well, thank you, Cindy. Um, let's see. Our uh, next, next person with a hand up is uh, uh, Christy Smith. Christy, go ahead. Hi. Uh, I'll try to be brief. This is Christy Smith. Um, I will say that auditory crosswalks are very rarely at the correct volume. Um, and you would probably obviously think that if they're too quiet, that that is an issue. And, and yes, many, many um, signals are too quiet. Um, there's also one, and I haven't really been out of my house since March, so I don't know if this has been fixed. Um, there's one that is located right outside of the Silver Spring Metro Station uh, that is what at least was drastically too loud and it made it really difficult to listen for the cars around that intersection and uh, it was very startling and surprising um so the volume is a big issue thank you very much uh thank you christy um looks like um sorry we have um lauren uh lauren if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself go ahead uh, yeah, yeah. This is Lauren. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, um, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, sorry. So I, I I'm, um, I, uh, I have low vision, um, but I, but I still have vision that I can use, so I don't have to use a guide dog or white cane right now. But uh, I guess with, um, with intersection, intersection and crosswalks, I think maybe a challenge for me would be um, at crosswalks. Um, and I guess I don't know if this is really a design issue or more an enforcement issue, but just so many cars do not. Um, if it's not like a tra traffic light, if it's just a crosswalk, so many cars. Um, and bicycles especially, um, do not really obey the law that you're supposed to stop for a pedestrian crossing this, the, uh, the crosswalk there. And I know that that's a challenge for, you know, going to be a problem for people even with regular vision, but I think it's particularly challenging for those with visual impairments who may just, like with a limited depth of field like I have, may not see the car coming or the bike coming out of the corner of their eyes. And, and they, they, you know, we expect the car to stop or the bicycle to stop. And um, I feel like I've had several very near misses closer than, closer than I would have liked. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Um, looks like we have a, a phone number ending in 0589. If your phone number ends in 0589, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. You can dial uh, star nine to unmute yourself. Go ahead. Hello, this is Jill. Um, I have, uh, I'm legally blind. I have a myriad of ophthalmological issues since birth. You name it, I've got it, except macular degeneration. Um, the intersection, uh, when you come out of the Wheaton Metro and you make the right to go down to the traffic light to cross over to Wheaton Plaza, there's a concrete barrier around that uh uh, entrance that allows you to enter into the crosswalk. Well, I have very 
poor, limited uh, depth perception. And I, I, I have seen the, the concrete barrier. I haven't tripped over it. And what I have to do is walk around that concrete barrier and not step over it, walk, walk to my right, and then enter uh, in the entrance area of it. So what I'm suggesting, I don't know why the concrete barrier is there, that there should be no concrete barrier there at all, because I can't, well, I know it's there, but I'm saying I have no depth perception. If I didn't know it was there, I'd be flat on my face with a broken nose. So, and I'm sure there are other intersections in Montgomery County that are, are like that. I don't know why the reason for the concrete uh, barrier on, on either side of, of that walkway entrance is. So that's my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jill. Um, uh, looks like uh, Wendelin. Hi, yes, my name is Wendelin and uh, I am legally blind and I use a guide dog. Uh, sometimes I also use my white cane. And my, one of my comments would be kind of, you know, a little bit towards the sidewalk thing, but it definitely is um, uh, an intersection crossing thing. I live here in downtown Silver Spring and with the um, increase in outdoor dining, uh, there's a couple of places on Georgia Avenue uh, that I've noticed, uh, well, one right now, an Ethiopian restaurant has a tent up and you actually have to walk through the tent, uh, I guess. My guide dog and I were quite confused. I guess you have to walk through the tent if you want to keep uh, going on the sidewalk, but it's really, that, that area is really narrow. So then, you know, it, it, it's kind of close to uh, one of the corners. Um, and then I've also seen uh, in that area as well for other establishments that, you know, they have, you know, chairs and tables and all that on, on the sidewalk. And sometimes they are near um, the intersections at times and makes it a little confusing for myself and my dog to, to navigate around them. So that, that's one thing I would mention. Another thing too about the, that's, I guess, almost become a pet peeve of mine about the audible cross signals is there are tons of them. I, I, I don't have enough fingers and toes at this point. The ones I run into just maybe here in downtown Silver Spring that do not work. I don't know if they're shut off when there's construction at some point or what the issue is, but I think it would be good if it was well publicized how to report those and you know, it, you know, if there was a way to, you know, get information back that, you know, it's been fixed, that there's at least two over here on Wayne Avenue and Dixon Avenue that I don't think they've worked for at least a year and a half. And so um, that, 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 that's a big thing. And then the, the last thing is just to concur on what somebody said about crosswalks. I can't tell you how many times my guide dog and I have had to go out into an intersection to get around a sighted person in their car who supposedly had enough vision to get their driver's license, but didn't read the part of the driver's manual. Those are my comments. Uh, thank you, Wendell. And well, I, I will uh, follow up with our signals team about the Wayne Avenue and Dixon Avenue um, APS signal. But what I can tell you is uh, there's two ways that you can report these to us. Uh, the easiest is probably to dial 311. That's easy to remember. If you just dial 311 and make a report, you can also email. Um, the email address is traffic, T R A F F I C, traffic ops, O P S. So it's traffic ops, not, not traffic cops, but traffic ops at montgomerycountymd.gov. And I'll, I'll put that in the chat. Um, but uh, but that's, that's another way you can email and just email where what intersection it is and what's wrong with it and we can get our team out there to try and address that so thank you email. thank you for that that, that the email is probably the best thing right now because i i will make a i'll it, it'd be better for me to just probably email a list and call 311 keep somebody on the phone <laughs> okay and uh, jim how are we how are we doing on time Let's we have about three hands about 10 minutes for this question 
So maybe one one more response and then we move on. Okay, um, I'm gonna call on um, phone number ending in uh, 5301. If your phone number ends in 5301, uh, you can go ahead and give us your comment, go ahead. Yeah, this is a Brett Relia really again. I like to follow up on these maintenance issues people keep bringing up in the sidewalks and crosswalks. Um, it's a real problem. I um, noticed, I found out that at the corner of Ramsey and, and uh, Wayne Avenue, that the Ramsey Avenue was constructed so poorly that the water was pooling right at the, um, right at the, the curb of the, of the ramp, bottom of the ramp through the crosswalk and freezing during the winter and people were slipping and falling. I even talked to the crossing guard and she said, this has been a continual problem. So I called 311 and reported it, um, and along with some missing bricks on uh, right in the same location. And an inspector came by like within a week, and they fixed the bricks, and he confirmed that the uh, uh, this pooling, freezing water. It took me three years to get that, that intersection realigned. I must made I must have made twenty phone calls to uh, uh, Montgomery County Transportation. Not once did they ever call me back. I called up three hundred one customer service. They never could give me a response other than than the county's transportation is looking into it. Finally, I had to call the county executive. And this is three years, and the county executive ordered that it be fixed. There's a real process problem here where it takes years and years to get, and this is a icing. This is where people were falling and tripping and hurting themselves. And it still took three years for that to get fixed through the 311 process. Um, um, this is this is just like unacceptable. I guess there's no one that follows through on any of this stuff or inspects it or what, I don't know what's going on, but it's not working. That's all. All right, well, thank you for that comment, Brett, and I do apologize. Um, we, we don't always get it right, but we are trying to do a better job, so, so thank you for those comments. Uh, Jim, why don't we go ahead and move on to the next item? I know we, we do still have two hands up, if you guys can- well, I, I, do have, I do have a comment. Okay, well, we, we, we do wanna try to make sure we get to the whole agenda. That's why we're, we're trying to limit each item to 10 minutes, so if you can be really brief. Yeah. Awesome. Um, really brief. Go ahead. I, I, Yes, I, I will be as, as, as brief as possible on this. Um, my issue has to do with the uh, audio producing signals and the way Montgomery County or, or DOT tries to deal with the problem. When I reported my issue with the bus car noise at the traffic intersection, what they did was to simply increase the volume thinking that that would fix it. But they don't seem to realize that there is a careful balancing of um, signal information that you get, that you use as a blind person when you cross the street. So, because you'll never be able to compete with the volume of a busker. Uh, you, you need the, the traffic information, you need the traffic noises, you need the, the walking noises, and of course you need the, the, the signal uh, noises in order for you to navigate. And uh, I, 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 I hope that they start using professional consultants when coming up with solutions. And I'm assuming this is part of that process, or at least I hope it is. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for that comment, Ansel. Um, so go ahead, Jim, and move on to the next, uh, our next question. Yeah, so this is our third question. What do you find challenging about navigating separated bike lanes and floating bus stops? For those of you who may be unfamiliar with floating bus stops, they're sometimes installed in conjunction with separated bike lanes. Getting to the stop from the sidewalk then requires crossing a bike lane to an island where the bus stop is located. Um, we've set aside a little bit more time for this one. We know that there's been a lot of focus on it lately, so 15 minutes for this. Um, on the phone, again, raise your hand by dialing star nine and on the computer, use the shortcut Alt Y. All right, uh, Patrick Sheehan has his hand up. So Patrick, do you wanna go ahead? Thank you, thank you, Matt. I appreciate you having this session tonight. 
Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the uh, two points with respect to floating bus stops. We think that the design of these floating bus stops is dangerous. We would request a moratorium on any new construction. And we think that the floating bus stops, should, uh, dis the ones that are up should be dismantled. Uh, there are a couple things with the floating bus stops that are, that are difficult. We understand that you're trying to take bicycles and scooters off the primary sidewalk but the de dedicated bike lanes and putting a bus stop in the middle of the street uh, protects the bike riders, but does nothing for the blind person who has to um, cross that eight foot area while bikes are, and e-scooters are zooming down the pathway, hoping that the bikes and the e-scooters will stop on their own. Uh, that's very dangerous. We're relying on the good decisions by bikes and e-scooters to, to uh, do what is correct. And that's not helping guide dog users or blind people that can't hear them coming. There are better solutions um, that are out there. John Hubler has, uh, um, has uh, shown a bunch of us a shared platform that allows the bus stop to be still on the sidewalk, allows the... Um, the bus to pull up and gives the same advantage to bicyclists and e-scooters uh, as they would have on a dedicated de dedicated bike lane. I would suggest that before more construction uh, goes forward that you look at solutions like that. The um, My other point is that I think the process for making construction decisions like this is um, uh, is flawed. Uh, obviously, the the cycle community was was uh, was consulted, but I don't think that the blind community was. Uh, you have you have um, Vision Zero uh, that has uh, that who um, has issues with uh, floating bus stops. Uh, you have the pedestrian master plan that conflicts with the bicycle master plan. You have safe routes to schools policy that is in place that doesn't, uh, that conflicts with everything else. Your processes for putting and constructing safe streets, uh, pedestrians, uh, access areas, sidewalks, it's not coordinated. It's, and so you've got a and you have a construction issue. And I think those are two things that need to be checked into. Bring the right people to the table. Let's get uh, construction that can work for both bicycles and pedestrians and e-scooters because that's what's gonna solve the problem. Thanks. All right, thank you, Patrick. Those are good comments. And I know we've chatted before and I look forward to continuing to chat with you as we work through this. So there's a lot of a lot of stuff that we need to work on. So thank you for those comments. Um, uh, Christy Smith, you have your hand up, go ahead. Uh, yes, I'd like to echo what the previous commenter said. I completely agree with everything that was said. Um, I would like to say as for myself, it, it's very difficult to hear bicycles. Uh, so crossing bicycle lanes to me often feels even more dangerous than crossing a traditional roadway. Um, bicycle lanes do not always stop uh, at a intersection, um, such as in, in T-shaped intersections or at floating bus stops, um, uh, meaning you may have to independently determine when it is safe to cross. Um, and it can also be confusing to encounter barriers that separate uh, separated bike lanes uh, because they, from the top, often feel like construction cones um, and so that can create a lot of anxiety and confusion. All right, thank you, Christy. Those are good comments as well. Um, looks like we don't have anyone else with their hand up right now. So oh, we just got a hand. Um, phone number ending in 5301, Brett. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm here. I have some experience with these floating um, uh, bus zones, 
and uh, bus stops and uh, bike lanes in the District of Columbia, where they've proliferated quite a bit. And I would like to agree with the other two speakers that that there are obvious problem for pedestrians, especially pedestrians with disabilities, trying to cross these, um, you know, dedicated bike areas, bike lanes, and trying to access the the floating zone, especially when the crossing is not at the intersection. The crossing is set back, you know, 40 or 50 feet from the intersection to get onto the floating island. So bicycles and scooters never adhere, never pay attention to these setback crossings. So it's just just dangerous for the pedestrians trying to access the bus floating island. Um, I agree that these need to be serious looked at. I mentioned this to Matt when we were talking about the Fenton Street bike plan. And certainly I agree with the first speaker, which which and I pointed this out to Matt, that these various plans, the pedestrian plan, the bike plan, you know, the safe routes to school plan, the Fenton bikeway, none of these plans are coordinated. Doesn't seem anybody there who is a uh, who is a, uh, a, a, a disability specialist being being consulted and reviewing these plans because the conflicts are just. Uh, just continue. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Um, let's see. Um, Ansel, uh, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yes. Um, I have had some dealings with the, um, the floating bus stops in DC. And actually, I, I believe I first encountered them when I traveled to Europe in uh, downtown Amsterdam. And my first encounter with them was a bit terrifying because I got off the bus, didn't know anything about floating anything, uh, and was did not realize that I was really in the middle of the road. And I almost got hit by a vehicle. So I would imagine if if I had that problem, I'm sure other people who are blind uh, could have that problem. Uh, and then the other thing is uh, locating them. If you are if you are blind and you're looking for a bus stop, um, you know how are you supposed to figure out that this stop is in the middle of of the you know the the the, the roadway. Um, and then the other thing, uh, just a comment on these people that we are supposedly trying to protect, uh, the bikers and the scooter folks, uh, they are not, my experience with many of them, I'm sure it doesn't apply to everybody, can't generalize like that, but my encounter with them is that many of them are renegade users of the road. Many of them ride up on the sidewalk when they're not supposed to, uh, and many of them, you know, sort of jostle their way through the traffic light uh, because they feel that they don't have to obey traffic laws. And I know the reason why these, these stops are being set up like that is because of their advocacy. And they're heavily organized. They're very militant about it. Uh, and they combine with, you know, the green people. And, uh, you know, so they're all concerned about you know, supposedly their health and well-being, but they could care less about us blind folks or disabled people who are negatively impacted uh, by their lunacy. Um, so I am very much opposed to them because I believe that many of those, many of the folks are very who, who advocate for these things, they are very selfish and they have no empathy for persons with disabilities. They can care less. Thank you. Thank you, Ansel. Um, next up we have, um, looks like Jill. Phone number ending in 0589, Jill, go ahead. Yes, yes, sir. 
Um, I did not get the list of uh, questions uh, that you are asking, so I figured this was my moment to say something targeted mainly to the metro buses in Montgomery County, uh, the metro ride, not the ride on system in Montgomery County and uh, the metro subway system uh, throughout the Washington, D.C., well, not I don't drive to, well, Washington, D.C., Virginia, and Montgomery County. You're uh, but mostly targeted to the metro buses in Montgomery County. Um, I used to be able to read the, the, um, num- the number, the number on the bus. Um, I no longer can do that skill. Uh, I don't use a white cane or a dog at the moment, although my days are numbered for that task to learn. But most of the time on the metro buses, they uh, do not, there are two things that they don't do. They don't, the GPS doesn't anna- verbally announce the the metro bus stop that you are at uh, Connecticut Avenue, uh, Belpre Road, uh, Arcola Avenue, blah, blah, blah. And also, uh, as the buses come up, uh, until last week, you had to enter at the middle of the bus. The buses uh, don't signal that this is a Y2, a Y7, or a Y8. I have learned over the last uh, almost three years, uh, because I had a uh, cornea surgery in Hopkins, and uh, I had a very quote, sick cornea, and I had what was, I had what was put over my cornea, a Gunderson flap, which let, lend, lended me totally blind in my left eye. Um, I knew that going into surgery, so it was no big surprise. And I have learned from that surgery that I cannot track, visually track, um, too too much of anything. So if the bus is coming up and I want the bus that's a Y7 or a Y8 that goes into Leisure World, the bus is moving so fast that I can't track that the, the, the number on the bus. And again, they don't announce what the bus the bus stop is and I've gotten off several times at the at the wrong bus stop and believe me I know Georgia Avenue like the back of my hand so I wish Metro would mandate strongly mandate that they use you know the GPS and and, and announce those things and I'm sure I'm a hundred percent right for people who are uh, totally blind or have much, much, much less eyesight than I do. So that's my comment. I'm sorry that I was a little off t- tangent on screwing in on the bu- the bus stop. I don't, I don't recognize, I don't remember bus stops that had bus lanes and buses in Montgomery County. Maybe I'll focus in on that when I'm running around on the bus. Okay, thank you for my comment. Uh, thank you, Jill. It's a, it's a good comment, and we can uh, we don't operate the metro buses, but we can certainly try and get uh, those comments to uh, the appropriate people at metro. Um, uh, um, Dingram, oh, uh, Dingram, you have your hand up. Am I am I on? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Am I unmuted? We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. I just had a quick comment about some of the new bike lanes that they're creating now, the two-way bike lanes where they've got them going in both directions on one side of the street. And I think those are incredibly difficult for those of us who can't see where we're going. It's bad enough to try to worry about bikes coming that are going in the same direction as the car, but when you've got to worry about bikes going in two directions, it's just almost impossible to cross those things safely. That's, That's my comment. All right, thank you for that, that comment. Um, those are all the hands that were up now. Anyone else have a comment related to floating bus stops? Or can, bike can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank we can you. hear. Thank this, you. This is Susan Crawford and I apologize. For some reason, um, I can't get the keypad to work and, and I'm not finding the race. 
raise uh, my hand, but thank you. Thank you, and I, I appreciate you having this forum tonight. And I would just like to echo all the others uh, that follow Pat Sheehan's lead and ask that the county stop the installation of the floating bus stops. And my understanding is that there's um, a new model that's, that uh, several people have seen um, that, that Pat and Mary Beth Cleveland and Francie Gilman have seen, and it seems like it's very workable. It also has the advantage of saving the county a ton of money because you don't have to move the bus shelter and everything else to an island. You leave it on the sidewalk where it's needed. And so then someone can go to that shelter and you know, usually there's a push button or there's a braille and, and raised uh, characters and you can just identify if this is where you need to be. That's really, really crucial. Um, uh, also, if and when, the county starts to plant trees again, that would provide shade and make it much more enjoyable. Um, it is so intimidating to, to even think about using the floating bus stops. I mean, it, it just, it's just not a good design for people who use the bus. And if you want people to use the bus, then you need to make it safe and enjoyable. There's nothing enjoyable about it right now. But mainly it's, it's a huge expense and it's not safe. And I urge that there be a moratorium on the floating bus stops and just proceed with the pilot on the new one that's being tried. And if that seems workable, go with that and just leave the bus shelters on the curb. And it will be easy enough to put in the rumble strips along where the bicyclists would be coming up off the bikeway um, onto the sidewalk and across and then back down and so that um, pedestrians could hear the bicyclists coming and then they would also have signage saying that they need to slow down. So that's my request. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Susan, for, for those comments. And, and Susan, I, I have to thank you also for, for actually going out and meeting with us in the field uh, several years ago. Uh, with with your husband, I'm very sorry that we lost Charlie. He was a, a good advocate, and uh, so thank you for for all the work that you've done to to get the conversation going with us. We did have a question in the comments um, from Akram, basically asking what uh, the, the bus stop that uh, that Pat and Susan have uh, asked about, and what's being referred to as what's called a shared um, bike lane bus platform and. What this means basically is um, the bus stops in the roadway and then there's a, a raised platform. Uh, the bike lane is still right next to the bus. The bus does not pull into the bike lane because the bike lane is raised. Uh, and immediately behind that uh, bike lane is the sidewalk with the bus stop. So what this means is people who are boarding the bus still have to cross over the bike lane to get on the bus, um, but they don't have to cross over the bike lane to get to the bus stop or the bus shelter. And this presumes that when the bus is present, that cyclists will stop as, as, as pedestrians cross over the bike lane, but they, they would still have to cross over the bike lane, just to be clear. Um, and Montgomery County is looking at, at, at constructing one of those as an interim bus stop up in Germantown. Um, I believe DC has at least one that I'm aware of. Uh, I'm not sure if they have any others that are uh, constructed, but there's one that's located at uh, M Street and 24th Street Northwest. That's uh, basically very similar to that. Hey Matt, this is Seth Morgan. I, I can't get my ELT Y to work, uh, but I would like to make a comment if I may. Yeah, go ahead, Seth, thank you. Yeah, I am the chair of the Commission on People with Disabilities and Matt, you and I and multiple other members of your department have met with us uh, on, on numerous occasions. I do wanna point out that while we are emphasizing the visual uh, Pro, the, the, the vision impaired individuals in this discussion that the whole issue of floating bus stops are a problem for people with mobility, people who are in wheelchairs, people who have hearing uh, impairment. These are dangerous uh, uh, entities for those individuals as well. And one of the, to echo one of the comments that was made earlier, one of the problems that we have obviously is that um, cooperation from users of the um, bicycles uh, has not been particularly uh, uh, 
good. And I, I never understood that because it takes two to have an accident. It's not like the bike rider is going to come out of a collision safely and it's only going to endanger the person with a disability. But for whatever reason, we can't seem to get them on board to make these uh, uh, floating bus stops safer. One of the things that I have recommended in the past, including calling for a moratorium on them until we could get it straightened out. But one thing that I think is very important is an on-demand uh, flashing red light that would stop. Uh, and and I, we, we even discussed putting a, a barrier there, although I think that's less likely to happen. But at a very minimum of flashing red light uh, that is impossible to ignore that would specifically uh, stop or potentially uh, stop the bicycle riders as they approach the, uh, the uh, uh, area where people are crossing uh, to get to the bu floating bus stops. But I, I, you know, I, think I would like that to uh, be a, a, an important part of the discussion. I think, I don't believe that every bice, uh, bicycle rider is out to uh, not follow the rules. And I think we just have to make it more apparent for them when they have to be uh, aware of what else is happening as they approach these floating bus stops. Thank you. All right, thank you, Seth. Um, hey, I Matt. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry, this is Bong. Um, Go ahead, Bong. I, I, I'd just like to say something if, if I could. Um, so, um, I'm Bong Dorazario. I am the Director of Transportation Policy for the Maryland Department of Disabilities. Um, and uh, not to take away anything from, from this meeting or Matt, um, but I do kind of want to echo what Seth had, uh, was just mentioning um, and, and let everybody else know on this call um, that uh, if you'd like, I can ask Matt to, to, to drop my email um, in the chat. Um, for everyone to have, but um, as far as floating bus stops are concerned, um, you know, it, 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 Matt and I have, have had a number of, of discussions along with MDOT as well, um, and MTA um, as well um, for the other areas. Um, but um, I would like to try to see it safer if, if, if the islands, you know, or, or the floating bus stops, you, you know, aren't um, go going to be removed, which in my eyes, in my personal opinion, probably not, you know, they could be as safe as possible for all users. And like Seth said, um, you know, main, the, mainly we talked about low vision and, and blind on this call. And um, it's, it, it, it is bigger than that. It's not taking away from that, but it is bigger than that. I myself am a wheelchair user. Um, so some of the safety precautions, um, you know, that come into to question um, as far as um, what to use um, for the low vision and for the blind community. Um, for example, the, the rumble strips, they could be a little harsh on wheelchair users, especially those who are, um, you know, paralyzed from the neck down or the waist down. Um, so it, it, it's all of us collectively um, coming together and, 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 and trying to come up with better solutions, I think. Um, and again, um, I think Matt just dropped my email um, in there. Um, I had one session last month um, regarding floating bus stops. I do plan on having another one sometime in mid-February. Um, and for those who are on the call that were on that call with me, um, I apologize. I have not gotten the minutes out uh, quite yet, um, well, in, in full, but they will be coming shortly. Um, I've had some issues, um, one, getting the minutes, and then two, um, some computer issues at work. But um, again, for, for those who have not been on the call, for those who are not familiar with me, I would love for you guys to, um, you know, email me uh, with your inputs and so forth. Um, and again, you know, I, uh, I thank Matt for, for, for doing this meeting um, and including, you know, the, the floating bus stops in it as well. So oh, I just want to do a quick time check. It's 8.22. Uh, we were originally scheduled for this meeting to go until 8.30. So uh, I think we had one more question and then we needed to get into some next steps and things. So we are running a little bit late. So 
Uh, Jim, if you want to go ahead and move on to the next item. Sure. So next next question is just kind of a catch all. Um, for those of you who didn't get to, to comment um, earlier about sidewalks, intersections, floating bus stops, or for those of you who want to, to, to comment about other types of public spaces, now is your opportunity. And I, I will real, really ask you to keep it brief this time because we do want to make sure we get to the end um, and not keep people too late. Uh, Martha Levin. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm blind in one eye and low vision in the other from Neon optic nerve strokes, two of them at different times. And I live in a retirement community in Sandy Spring. Um, I just wanted to share what I shared with you, Matt, earlier on an email about my experience at a Metro in Bethesda. Wasn't able to go down the escalator because I have a small service dog that I have emotional support dog in a stroller and the elevator wasn't working and somebody told me to use, to pick up my dog, fold the stroller and go down the escalator. And I said, absolutely not. I wasn't gonna do that because it was dangerous. And bottom line, I got some assistance from the help button at the elevator and got on bus 46 to Wheaton Plaza to Wheaton Metro. And I was able to navigate from that but it was really scary. Um, I do use Metro Access a lot. I haven't really had a lot of issues with that. And thank you for this forum. And, you know, thank people for sharing their other experiences. And I, I get around with a support cane, not a white cane. It did me no good when I used the white cane. So. Thank you, Martha. Um, Sonia Torres. Yes, hi. You can hear me? Go ahead. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, hi. Yeah, I am. I'm blind and use a white cane. Uh, I live in downtown Silver Spring. I would like to echo some of the sentiments that, uh, of course, my husband Ansel Torres and, you know, other folks have uh, said here, um, particularly for the, regarding sidewalks and also crossing and intersections. Um, one of the things is that, you know, the, the sidewalks, I feel, is just there. They're just too crowded. There's just so many things on the sidewalks. You have benches, planters, bike racks, and this and that, and all, all kinds of objects in the way. I just wish that there's, you know, you guys can make the sidewalks just for people to walk, you know, instead of crowding with all kinds of obstacles and objects in the way. Uh, and also another thing is the... Um, there should be some kind of a, a, a noise limitation, especially in downtown Silver Spring with those buskers and performers that they should not allow performers to perform at an intersection because it makes it really, really hard uh, for blind people to cross streets when they're making a lot of noise because we have, we have to listen for the, listen out for the traffic and audio signals and all of that. It makes it really, really difficult for us to cross the street. And that's, that's something that my husband and I, we have been facing for, for many years now, and we have uh, tried to uh, reach out to MCDOT and, and nothing is really being done about this. And I think there should be some kind of limitation put on that because that's just, it's very dangerous. It's not safe at all. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Um, we have a couple hands left. Um, Jim, uh, just wanted to check in and see what, you know, how much longer do we think they need to finish off the presentation? Well, I was thinking about maybe skipping to the next really big question that we want to ask, which is about um, planning and engaging people with vision disabilities in the planning and design process. I think it would be great to get people's feedback on that. Um, yeah thinking that maybe we should should skip over some of the remaining presentation because of time. Yeah, so let's uh, let's go ahead and do that. And if we still have a little bit of time left at the end, we can take some more questions we, and comments. We do wanna get as many comments as we, as we can, but we also wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So go ahead and, and move on, Jim. Okay, so I'm gonna blow by a few slides here.
So I think this is a really important question that we'd really like your feedback on. It is, how do you think people with the county could do a better job of engaging people with vision disabilities in street planning and design projects? Um, once again, on, on the phone, raise your hand dialing star nine and on the computer, use the shortcut alt Y. Okay, I see uh, Debbie Brown, you have your hand up, go ahead. All right, good, it worked. Um, okay, um, I am concerned that when you make a decision, first of all, we can't see architectural designs and we don't know sometimes what you're talking about so, I mean, unfortunately, I don't know why you decide you're going to do this right now when nobody can go anywhere and you're going to ra railroad something through and we can't check things out because, you know, there's a lot of places, but we can't, you know, that people can't get out right now. Um, but people need to be able to see what something is. So sometimes we might need an example. If there's an example in the local area that we can go and visit of what you're going to do, um, We'd like to know where that is and see how it how it works um, because we don't always know what people are talking about. I, I didn't know what this stuff was until I saw one, um, you know, the, the floating bus stops and all that. So, um, you know, don't go gung-ho and designing something. You might want to design, design some, if it's really, there's no other way to test it out, to design something somewhere and test it out. Um, but that's that's the way you know we need to and you know we have a limited number of us and some of us that are on here where we represent organizations of, of blind people that commission on disabilities it's you know it doesn't you know it doesn't necessarily represent and it doesn't it's not required to represent all of the um you know every disability so if you're really concerned about blind people then you need the groups that that are representing blind people to to do that and certainly we understand and, and to moderate with people with other disabilities but um it's not very representative of blind people so that you you need to find the groups we're here so uh i um member i'm a president of the chapter of the national federation of the blind so um, you need to call on us and, uh, and so the groups you should know who we are and uh, and find us when you plan to do any kind of new design of, of street design and sidewalk design we should be consulted thank you debbie uh, and those are good points and we have been trying to do a much better job of reaching out to the commission and other people who have disabilities and that's part of what this process is is we're, we're here to reach out to you so thank you for those comments um let's see I, I do see some hands that we've we've seen before so that i've been trying to call on people who we have not heard from before um eileen klein i don't think we've heard from you yet eileen go ahead uh you're, you may be on mute eileen uh you can dial star six to unmute yourself or you're right Sorry, Go ahead. Go ahead. I was legally blind in 1998 and then through some surgeries, I got my sight and they've been watching me carefully. And then I lost it again in 2019, but, um, and that lasted a year, but um, it's back right now. Um, and um, it's back good enough that I'm even driving a car. But um, I have some things and I know we haven't discussed this and I'm not even sure if this is your purview, but, um, in the topics um, when I signed up for this, I thought it was gonna be traffic also. So I do have some things like if they would put reflective paint on all of the roads and especially two, um, two lane roads with no shoulders. For instance, one of the most treacherous roads to me is Falls Road. Um, in the rain or in the dark, it's virtually impossible. You cannot see the white paint on the roads. It, it needs to be the yellow reflective paint with the little tiny beads in it. Um, and uh, also when you when you have islands, um, for instance, Old Georgetown Road has, and, and they're at, I call them islands. It's like um, a little sidewalk dividing the middle of the you know road going one way and versus one going the other. You can't see in the rain or the dark where those islands are. They need to be painted in the yellow reflective paint. Um, this is, this is good for not only people with disabilities, 
but the anybody who's growing older, their eyesight, everybody's eyesight gets poorer as we grow older. And um, but yet nobody's going to give up driving um, <laughs> as they get older. Um, so it, it's just a, a safety to everyone concerned if they would use, no matter what it costs, the reflective paint. Um, the crosswalks, if they would have the flashing lights um, in Rockville, we do have several places with the flashing lights. People just push a button and the light flashes all over the place. You can't miss it. Um, but if they could do that on you know, many more um, crosswalks, that would be really helpful, especially when the speed limit is like over 35 miles an hour, because you need time to stop and to prepare. And you know, sometimes like going down Wisconsin Avenue, all of a sudden they'll stop because there's a crosswalk and you don't know why the car in front of you is stopping. But that would be helpful too. The other thing about highways is if we could label with larger road signs and give you at least three exits in advance, like they do in Baltimore. The Baltimore Beltway is, is great for, um, for giving you notice about when your exit is coming up. Um, and that's enough, that's, thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Um, let's see, I see uh, about three hands and we are past 8.30. So what I'd like to do is just, if we could, Jim, Let's talk about next steps if you'll have an idea of where we're going and then I don't mind staying a little bit longer to answer some questions, but um, let's go ahead and go on to the next steps just so people have a sense of where we're going and then we'll come back and try and get any last comments. Okay, so that sounds good. So he, here are the next steps. We'll send out a survey uh, later, later this week to get additional feedback from you and others on the topics we discussed today. So if you didn't have an opportunity to, to answer a question, uh, that we posed today, um, or you have additional thoughts, you'll be able to do it uh, through the survey. We're also going to, to attend this week's Commission on People with Disabilities meeting to receive additional feedback and answer questions. We are developing the draft toolkit, toolkit that Matt mentioned, and once that's done, we'll, we'll share it with stakeholders. Um, there's also a pilot aspect of this project, as, as Matt Matt mentioned earlier as well. Um, the first step there is to identify the pilot location. Um, so we're looking for your feedback on that. And we'll be doing additional outreach for the, for the pilot design, including conducting interviews with people who have vision disabilities to understand the, the, the specific challenges that they face at that location. And finally, there will be a report, a final report that includes the toolbox and the pilot drawings um, Report is really just a, a first step for the county. As Matt mentioned, this is a really quick process. So we are, um, we're developing a, a toolkit that, that the county and the region can use, um, but there's more that needs to be done and we recognize that. Anything I missed there, Matt? No, I think you got everything. That's, that's good. So, um, we, we uh, like I said, we already are past our time and we did skip over a couple of slides. I just wanted to talk really briefly kind of about what the toolkit, what sort of things we can come get out of the toolkit. Um, we heard a lot from you, from everyone who was here tonight. And I think that there's really helpful feedback. One of the concerns we heard, for example, was obstructed sidewalks. So looking forward, our toolkit might recommend something like a clear path that's direct and is free of furniture. And we sort of get a sense of, of what, um, exactly what um, is uh, necessary to really make that work. Another thing that we could um, consider are um, directional indicators. So what we've used a little, used those very limited in Montgomery County, but you know, how do you find an intersecting path when you're on a sidewalk, maybe not at an intersection? So those are the sorts of things that we're looking for to, to incorporate. We wanna keep you all involved as we go through that process. Um, to understand what the trade-offs are, um, to help us understand things that you do or don't want. Uh, and so I know we heard um, from, I believe it was Debbie who said, you know, we need to be involved in the process early on. Well, that's what we're here for. We're trying to get you involved as early as possible. Um, I know that we didn't have time to get to everyone's comments. We had a, I did see a lot of hands and we did hear from a lot of people. So um, we still have, I think, three hands up. So I'm just gonna take an opportunity to call on those three people. Um, and if you, um, if you have any other comments or questions, we are gonna send a survey out in the next few days, it'll go to everyone who registered for the meeting um, or expressed interest in the project. So that'll give you an additional opportunity to fill in any um, 
comments or questions you, or concerns you have about the project. So with that, um, Liliana Gillespie, uh, you have your hand up, go ahead. Hi, yes, um, I'm Liliana and I have uh, retinous pigmentosa, so I um, cannot see at night. <laughs> I have very limited vision at night um, and it's I can see fine during the day, but the second it starts to get a little dark, mm -mm, can't see. Um, and so I forget who mentioned it, but um, sidewalks and at, um, oh, where is it? Uh, University Boulevard, that intersection, absolutely horrendous being able to see. It doesn't have any kind of those blinkers or uh, the audio. Uh, I can never tell when cars are coming. Um, it's just something for me personally that even, especially during the day that it's just very difficult uh, to maneuver. Uh, again, I can't remember who mentioned the reflective uh, lights um, throughout streets and that, that would also be something, especially when I'm out at nighttime, um, because again, I can't really see things. Um, so I have to really rely on kind of the vision that I do have. Somebody else brought up the uh, street performers and Danton Silver Spring. That as well is a big thing for me because they'll usually be there in the evening. I mean, I'm trying to listen for sounds, it kind of interferes because since I can't see at nighttime, my, my hearing is amplified. So I tend to rely on that, but excess sounds or not being able to hear anything at all is kind of puts me in an even worse space uh, than I would be just, than I am already. Um, so I think just trying to control noise and just let light during the evening really helps me. And I'd like to see more of that in the area of um, Montgomery County. Uh, thank you, Lily. Can you said there was an intersection at University. Uh, what, do you know what the cross street is, University and what? Uh, I think it's Colesville, University Boulevard and Colesville Road. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, we also have um, Jill, phone number ending in 0589, Jill. Go ahead, Jill. Um, hi, I'll just pass on my question and give somebody else a turn. Okay, thank you, Jill. Um, looks like Dingram, you're, you have your hand up. Okay, did I, did I unmute? Yes, go ahead, Dingram. Okay, I just had a couple of questions about sidewalks there and, and also intersections where a lot of the places where they put up the signals for the pedestrians to push to get the light activated for the crosswalk, they're nowhere close to where you would normally stand to cross that intersection. I don't know how they think we're gonna be able to find those stupid things because they're, they're just not in logical places. They've also put these little curblets in a lot of places and I'm not sure why, but they're a real tripping hazard as you come around from one street and need to cross the other street. So those are really, really bad. Um, in Bethesda, they've got one area where they had a nice sidewalk and they put up a new building. And for some reason they decided it would make sense to put this little step at each end of the sidewalk. So about, I don't know, the normal sidewalk width from the intersection, you have to step off a step and it's a graduated height curved raised step so again it's white they put a little white edge on it so i guess they thought that was supposed to make it visible but that's great if you can see it but if you can't it's a real again another tripping hazard um and then what everybody else has said about the sidewalks just being too cluttered a lot of places outside sidewalks are way too narrow and especially where they've got eating facilities they tend to encroach badly on the sidewalk that's supposed to be kept clear for the pedestrians. People's chairs are left sticking out into them, et cetera. And it just makes it very hazardous to walk around. So that's, those are my main comments. Oh, one last thing. The, we, we have a lot of these metal boxes that are attached to telephone poles. And for some reason, they often have put them so that they project into the area that where you need to be walking and you have to dodge them, but they're right at face level or sometimes chest level, so your cane doesn't pick them up. If they were rotated around 
so that they weren't in the pedestrian pathway, that would be really helpful too. Those are just incredibly dangerous. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Those are good comments. Uh, looks like our last hand up is uh, Ansel. Go ahead, Ansel. My final comments tonight have to do with um, recommendations or a recommendation for, um, for different things. One, the issue of controlling the bike traffic or regulating the, the bikes and the scooters at the Polonium bus stops. Um, I don't know if this exists, but maybe we might want to look into it. Uh, just like you have speed bumps for cars so that they must slow down at certain places, I think um, we might want to consider having some sort of speed bump equivalent for the bikes and the scooters so that they don't go zooming past the intersection when they're supposed to either stop or slow down when people um, are trying to cross. Um, as far as feedback from the community, I just like in technology, you have beta testers. Um, perhaps you may want to set up some sort of database of, of people who uh, wouldn't mind volunteering to provide their comments on things that um, you are considering uh, so that we can give um, our feedback on it. I've had experience with Montgomery County where they spend a lot of time listening to you and then they just go about and do their own thing. Um, and which is, which is uh, most unfortunate. I almost feel sometimes like I've wasted my time in, in talking to them because if you were going to go do what you want to do anyway, um, you know, why talk to me, you know? Um, so that's, uh, the, the, uh, that's my uh, second recommendation that I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Ansel. Um, well, those are all the comments and questions that we have hands up for right now. So and we have gone over our time by about 15 minutes. So um, I, I just want to close by saying thank you to everyone who joined us. Uh, I also want to thank our uh, interpreters and our captioner uh, for joining us this evening. Um, so thank you. But thank you to all of you uh, for giving us your feedback, your comments. Um, we can't do this work without you. Um, and we're going to continue to work with you over the next six months as we, work, as we develop this toolkit, which we hope will be a way to create uh, better standardization and better facilities for everyone throughout the region, not, not just within Montgomery County, but to create a continuity of a, a continuity of experience for people who are crossing the, the state line um, or, or crossing county lines. Um, and we really do appreciate your feedback. So be on the lookout for the survey that's coming sometime this week um, to give us some additional feedback and, and look forward to um, other invites for public engagement as we go forward over the next couple of months. So thank you very much, everyone. And I want to wish everyone a, a, a good evening and stay safe out there. Thank you.